सहनावतु सहनाव भुनक्तु सह वीर्यन खरवा वहै तेजस्विनावधी तमस्तु मा विद्विषा वहै हि ओम शांति 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 ओम परमेश्वर गुड नाइस टू सी यू ऑल वेलकम टू ऑल ऑफ यू आई वाज वेरी happily surprised to see that uh, we uploaded this class last week 10000 people watched it as just unusual for a text on advaita vedanta to uh, gain that much interest so it's just a wonderful so special welcome to all the students watching online i'm glad you can join us <coughs> um yes you have a question no okay um <clears throat> as we uh go forward we're going to begin each class with this first verse which is a prayer so it's con- it's a convention to recite the prayer associated with the text at the beginning of each uh each class you remember that this first verse served a dual purpose the first verse was both a prayer and simultaneously it introduced our subject matter so for maybe for one or two days you can repeat after me and then later we'll recite together today recite after me chaitanyam sarvagam sarvam chaitanyam sarvagam sarvam sarva bhuta guha shayam sarva bhuta guha shayam यत सर्व विषयातीतम यत सर्व विषयातीतम तस्मै सर्व विदे नमः तस्मै सर्व विदे नमः and we had a rather lengthy discussion in our opening class uh, based on this very first verse that we suffer in life because of a failure to recognize that aspect of us the truth of who you are which is actually untouched by suffering as long as you have a physical body you're going to be subject to problems associated with the body and mind but your true nature as satchidananda atma is utterly unaffected by the problems of the body mind and outside world so these teachings are meant to remove and i like my my guru's expression these teachings are meant to remove that problem of self non recognition thereby removing the problem of suffering and as we discussed at some length the purpose of these teachings is not to impart philosophical truths the purpose of these teachings is to solve the problem of suffering so we saw that in our prior class <clears throat> and with the second verse shri uh shri shankara begins his teachings samapaya kriya sarva samapaya kriya sarva दारा दारा ब्रह्मविद्या वक्त वेद प्रचक्रमे वक्त वेद प्रचक्रमे the subject of the sentence is in the very last line vedaha the vedas you know as the source scriptures for the entire hindu tradition in shankara's time and place sp- religious and spiritual life was centered on the vedas so in order to understand shankara we need to understand something about the vedas in the way shankara understood it so we're going to spend a few minutes to get to get inside shankara's head so to speak otherwise this first verse won't make any sense so we need to understand the content and structure of the veda i'm going to go to the board to explain that yeah <clears throat> good so the uh you already know 
There are four Vedas, Rig, Sama, Yajur, and Atarva. Atarva. But what you may not know is the internal structure of each, each of those four Vedas. Each of the four Vedas has four parts. And in order to understand Shankara's verse, we actually have to understand this level of detail. The four parts, I'll, I'll give you the detail first and then the uh, bigger picture. The four parts are the Samhita, which are the prayers and, let me call them hymns. And I'll explain the purpose of each of these parts in just a moment. Second part is called Brahmana. The rituals. Next part is Aranyaka. Uh, meditations. And final part is Upanishad, more familiar. which are the spiritual teachings. So, these, <clears throat> the focus of the Veda can be understood really in a two-fold way. There is a karma, and I guess these are important terms, so that's why I'm writing them up here, karma kanda, Kanda means session, section. Karma in this context means rituals. When you talk about rituals, I'm sorry, when you talk about Vaidika karma, rituals with regard to the Vedas, you're talking about rituals. Vedic karma, Vaidika karma is rituals. So the first portion of, the, of each of the four Vedas is concerned with rituals, that's the Brahmana. The hymns of the Samhita Bhaga, Bhaga means portion, the Samhita Bhaga gives you the hymns that are recited during the rituals, and the Aranyaka Bhaga section gives you meditations, not meditations in general, meditations which are meant to support the rituals. They're not ordinary meditations, but they're specifically for the sake of these rituals. So all three parts of the Karmakanda are focused on rituals as opposed to the second part called Jnanakanda, the part concerned with Jnana, spiritual wisdom, knowledge. These two parts are actually meant for two groups of people. Depends on you. Let me preface that. The Vedas are meant for all, not for a certain subset of the population. So the Vedas have to be ready to address all our needs, <coughs> excuse me, all our goals in life. Goals in life, do you remember learning about the four Purushartas? Probably you know them well. The four goals of life, dharma, artha, and kama. Kama, desires, ple uh, pleasures. Let's say kama is pleasure. Artha, wealth, for the sake of future pleasure. Dharma, accumulating good karma for the sake of going to heaven. And you may have heard me explain this before. Kama is about happiness now. Artha is about happiness later in this life, wealth and security. Dharma is about happiness in your next life, having a good rebirth, going to heaven. These three purushartas are met through the teachings of the Karma Kanda of the Veda. So there's a, that's a correspondence here not a one-to-one -one correspondence like this, but the rituals accompanied by the hymns and meditations are meant for these three reasons. For example, there's a ritual called Putraka Meshti. Some of you know it's a ritual that was done if you wanted the birth of a child. Kama. Then there are other rituals that you, you would do for the sake of rain. 
You need rain for crops. You need crops because that's how you sustain yourself. And then there are still other rituals that you can do to accumulate enough good karma so that perhaps you can go to swarga, heaven, after this life comes to an end. All of these three goals of life are addressed by the karma kanda of the Veda. And most of you know there is a fourth purusharta, the one we focus on mostly, called moksha, liberation. And that fourth goal is specifically addressed through the final part of the Vedas. So we needed to get this overview. So we have three parts of the karma kanda to help you fulfill your goals of dharma, artha, and kama. You have the final part of the Veda, the jnana kanda, the Upanishads, which are meant to help you reach the ultimate goal of life called moksha. This is the overview we need. Otherwise, uh, this first verse won't be meaningful. So let's come back to that first verse. <clears throat> so what about the Vedas in that last line? Go up to the top now. The Vedas samapaya, having concluded, having concluded what? Sarvaha, kriyaha, all the kriyas, kriya means action in general, here it means rituals, nothing else. So have the Vedas, having concluded teaching all the rituals, all the rituals taught in the karma kanda of the Veda, and those rituals which have to be performed, there's some more details here, those rituals are dara, agni, adhana, purvikaha. Those rituals are purvikaha. They're preceded by two important qualifications. You have to be qualified to do the rituals. What are the two most important qualifications to do the rituals? One is dara, wife. You have to be married to perform these rituals. In, in, uh, in the Hindu tradition, you know, priests are married. So being married and your wife then is your partner in doing the, uh, in doing the ritual, sahadharmani. The wife is an equal partner in the performance of the ritual. So you need to be married and also you have to have performed agni adhana, the establishment of the ritual fire in your home. Now this is referring to traditions from you know, more than a thousand years ago. No one, I, I don't know, in India, very few, if any, maintain a ritual fire in their homes. But in Shankara's day, it was certainly a requirement. So the Shankara says in his verse, having the Vedas, subject of the sentence, having concluded teaching all of the rituals preceded by your preparation by getting married and establishing the, uh, the ritual fire. And the, uh, then, then what? Last line, the Veda prachakrame proceeds vaktum to teach. The Veda then pr proceeds to teach. In fact, we met in the end of the third line, atta, then, idanim, now. The Veda proceeds to teach what? Brahma Vidyam. Knowledge of Brahma, that spiritual wisdom, the jnana that is communicated, that is communicated by that jnana kanda, the final section of the Vedas. Now, there are several little subtle points which, which need to be, to be seen here, and that is, Everyone starts off in life focused on dharma, artha, and kama. Everyone. But some people recognize the limitations of dharma, artha, and kama. And the limitations primarily that whatever you achieve in life is temporary. Whatever you gain can be taken away. 
As high as you rise, so to speak, you can fall. Anything and everything in life is temporary. So whatever you accomplish with the help of these rituals, all of the dharma, artha, and kama you manage to acquire in life, all of that is limited, time-bound, and when the benefits go away, you're back to a life of suffering. So you cannot solve the problem of suffering by pursuing dharma, artha, and kama. To pursue kama, pleasure, we all know that pleasures are short-lived. And if you have the pleasure of gaining a child, you know that, that even that pleasure is short-lived because by the time the child is a teenager, <laughs> maybe it's not all pleasure anymore. Similarly, artha, whatever wealth you gain, that wealth can be taken away. Even dharma, even going accumulating enough good karma to go to heaven, even that is time-bound. In the Hindu tradition, heaven is considered a temporary condition. Unlike the biblical Western traditions, which hold that heaven is eternal, the uh, ancient rishis were very clear that the, if the cause is finite, the result is finite. The cause is finite rituals. You can't do an infinite number of rituals. So finite rituals can only give you finite results, which means a limited period of enjoyment in heaven. Now, many people don't recognize that, and they remain, the technical word is bubukshu. You may not know that word. Let me write, let me write two words on the board. So those who are focused on gaining only dharma, artha, and kama, the technical word for them is bhubhukshu. How's that? One who wants to enjoy is bhubhukshu. That sounds like a more familiar word, doesn't it? Mumukshu? They're related grammatically. They're both called desideratives, one who has a desire. One who has a desire for enjoyment is a bhubhukshu. One who has a desire for dharma, art, and kama is a bhubhukshu. But one who has recognized the limitations of dharma, art, and kama, that person is a mumukshu. So there's a process of conversion that takes place here. We all start out as bhubhukshus, some of us through gaining some wisdom, worldly wisdom, recognizing the limitations of what you can accomplish in the world. Some people are converted from being babukshus to being mumukshus, seekers of liberation, seekers of moksha. Then, that's, so, so I said there are several things to point out. That's one thing to point out. So a mumukshu then, has a very different relationship with the Veda. A bubukshu will be focused on the karmakanda, obviously. A mumukshu will be focused on the jnana kanda, the section that contains spiritual wisdom, naturally. But does that necessarily mean that the bubuk, I'm sorry, that the mumukshu simply ignores the jnana kanda? I'm sorry, the karma kanda of the Veda. So when, when you decide, I'm a mumukshu now, I don't need the, the first part of the Vedas, that would be a little arrogant. And the reason why is that the rituals of the Veda can help you in a different way. When a mum, this is a little tricky, and you may not have heard this, this teaching. When a bhubhukshu performs those rituals, they do it for the sake of a worldly goal, kama, artha, or dharma, or dharma. But if you lived in this Vedic culture and you were a mumukshu, you might continue to do those rituals 
but with a very different motivation. Previously, you would have been motivated for the worldly result, or swarga, otherworldly result. But if you are truly mamukshu, you may continue to do the rituals in the karmakanda and the Veda, of the Veda, but for the different motivation, the motivation now being to gain, they call, the term used is chitta shuddhi, purity of mind. A pure mind means those rituals help you become a prepared student. And what the commentator and many others uh, explain is that in, spiritual, in any endeavor, there are many obstacles. So when there are obstacles in life, what do we do? Pray. There's Ganesha on her altar. When you encounter obstacles in life, you can pray to Ganapati. So suppose your goal in life is not dharma, artha, or kama. Suppose your goal is moksha. Do you think there can be obstacles? Of course. Whatever you pursue in life, you can encounter many obstacles. So when you encounter obstacles, what do you do? Pray. And in this case, you pray by performing the Vedic rituals, but for a very different purpose. So the mamukshu performs the same Vedic rituals, but not for the particular dharma, artha, and kama goals. Instead, the mumukshu can perform the very same Vedic rituals for the sake of removing obstacles, obstacles to enlightenment, gaining, and that's expressed in a technical term as chitta shuddhi, gaining purity of mind, becoming a prepared student. Okay. So, having the Vedas, having taught the Karmakanda, the rituals of the Veda, then Atta, then, meaning after, after and here that Atta, this, the, the commentator makes a big deal out of these two words, Atta and Idanim, for, for good reason. Atta then means after the conversion from being a bubukshu to a mamukshu. As long as you remain a bubukshu, you stay focused on the karma kanda of the Veda. But after you gain that transformation, that transformation, it's, it's a transformation of world view. You recognize the limitations of worldly life and turn your attention to spiritual life. Atta, then your attention is turned towards the jnana kanda of the Veda. You may continue to do the rituals, as we said, for chitta shuddhi, but your main focus is on the jnana kanda, the wisdom of the Vedas. So for that reason, idanim, now, vedaha prachakrame, the Vedas proceed vaktum to teach Brahma Vidyam, knowledge of Brahman, knowledge of reality. Why? As we said in the introduction, it is the failure to recognize your own true divine nature that makes you suffer. Remove that ignorance, suffering comes to an end. How to remove that ignorance? The Brahma Vidya, the knowledge of Brahman, knowledge of truth, knowledge of reality, that's taught in the final part of the Veda. Okay, then, we got two, two verses in a row here that are very linked, very interesting. Let's start. Karmani Deha Yogartam Karmani Deha Yogartam Deha Yoga Priya Priye Deha Yoga Priya Priye Dhruve Syatam Tato Rago Dhruve Syatam Tato Rago Dwe Shash Chaivatata Kriya Dwe Shash Chaivatata Kriya so here we get what's described in this verse, and the next verse is called samsara chakram. Chakra, the circle or cycle of samsara. Samsara means a life of worldly suffering. 
And that cycle begins where? Karmani, with karmas, with karmas from prior lives. Those karmas from prior lives are deha yoga artam. They are artam for the sake of deha yoga. Here yoga means being joined with, acquiring, being endowed with a body. So past karmas, karmani, are deha yoga artam. They lead to the acquisition of a body. Past karmas lead to the acquisition of a, of a body. Deha yoga, and when you are born with a body, then what? Priya priye dhruve syatam. Then two things, dhruve syatam, two things ab certainly ensue deha yoga when you have a body. What are the two things that come along with having a body? Priya and apriya. Priya is that which is pleasant. Apriya is that which is unpleasant. Often we use the terms simply sukha and dukkha. When you have a body, you will experience sukha and dukkha. Okay. So what? <laughs> he goes on to explain, tataha, this is the middle of the third line, as a result of that sukha and dukkha, what comes is raga and dvesha. Those of you who have attended the Bhagavad Gita class, you know that we define those two terms very carefully. Raga is best understood as a compulsion to pursue what you think you need for your welfare. Dvesha is best understood as a compulsion to run away from anything that you think is contrary to your well-being. So raga and dvesha are too often defined as likes and dislikes. They're not likes and dislikes, they're compulsions. When you are impelled by need to do, to pursue something, and, you're, and that compulsion is so strong, well, we'll see that in, in the next verse. So, you, you have this raga, if you have sukha, because you have sukha and dukkha, back up, because you have past karmas, you have a body. Because you have a body, you have sukha and dukkha. Because you have sukha and dukkha, you have raga and dvesha. And because you have raga and dvesha, which are compulsions, tataha, kriyaha, from that you have kriya action. You act. Driven by your raga and dvesha, you act. We're going we're gonna to see the whole cycle, but we need to see the uh, first half of the next verse to see the conclusion of the cycle. So let's see that right now. Dharma dharma tato gnasya Dharma dharma tato gnasya Deha yoga stata punaha Deha yoga stata punaha Evam nitya pravritto yam Evam nitya pravritto yam Samsarish chakravad brisham Samsarish chakravad brisham. So the cycle is continuing here. Notice the prior line ended. Tataha kriyaha. Tataha from that, because of raga and dvesha, kriyaha. You engage in what kind of actions? You engage in action. The next verse describes what kinds of actions. What kinds of actions do you engage in? Tataha. Therefore, you engage in actions which are both dharma and adharma. You engage in actions which are both righteous and unrighteous, which are dharmic and adharmic. Why, ad why would you engage in adharmic actions? Remember, raga and dvesha are compulsion. And those compulsions are strong enough to overcome your inborn sense of right and wrong. 
so that even though you know something is wrong, you can be compelled to do it anyway. You've all heard that, that the nice American expression when somebody says, just this once. That's such a telling expression. Somebody who says, just this once, is admitting that what they're about to do is wrong, and they're giving themselves to do it, <laughs> to permission to do it anyway, because they are compelled to do it. And why, are, why does that happen? Agnasya, for the, for the one who is ignorant, the one who is ignorant, who is overcome by raga and dvesha, and therefore driven to do acts which are both dharmic and adharmic. And as a result of committing both dharma and adharma, uh, then the third, uh, second line, tata, in the same way, punaha, once again, there is deha yogaha, acquisition of punaha, another body. So here we get the whole cycle. I want you to see the, the whole cycle uh, together. Back the slide up, yeah, and show you the whole cycle. All right, I think we can erase this. We need to erase this. Okay. So here's our cycle. Starting point was karma. Karmani. Can we go back one verse? So karmani, back one verse, yeah, that one, yeah. Karmani are those actions that, that we prefer, I'm sorry, karmani here refers to the results of your past deeds. Specifically, this is called sanchita karma, the accumulated karma, of prior lives, it is that karma which leads to your particular birth with a deha, with a body. I'll use more English words here. So that past karma leads you to have a body. Sometimes people ask the questions, well, wait a minute. So you're born because of your past karma, but then everyone will ask this question, not everyone, many people ask the question then, how did you get born the first time? So if you're born from karmas from your past life, and that life from karmas from your past life, that kar karmas from your past life, you can trace it back, life after life after life, leading to the question, well, how did you get born the first time? And the problem there is, who said there was a first? Time. We're talking about cycles. We're talking about things that are cyclic. That which is cyclic doesn't have a beginning. A circle has no beginning or end. That which is truly cyclic doesn't have a f beginning. So what all the scriptures teach is that there have been a beginningless series of prior lives. They, all the scriptures will use that kind of language. You have had an infinite number of prior lives. There was no first life. An infinite number of prior lives. And in that infinite number of prior lives, how much sanchita karma do you think you've accumulated? Exactly. <laughs> so you have an infinite amount of sanchita karma based on an infinite number of prior lives of small, I'm not going to teach the whole doctrine of karma here, but some of you will remember these terms, that from this infinite sanchita karma comes a small portion. Pardon me? What happened? Oh. That was my mistake. I didn't, I didn't uh, push the button. Sorry to our viewers watching online. Thank you. Um, 
So from that infinite sanchitta karma, a small portion gives rise to a body. Why? This body is only going to be around for 80, 90 years, right? So you need enough karma to keep the body going for 80 or 90 years. That portion is called prarabdha karma. I won't go into all the details. So a portion of that infinite sanchitta karma gives rise to your particular body. De and deha yoga, when you have a body, then what is the result? Shankara uses the words priya and apriya. We'll use the terms sukha and dukkha. Pleasure and pain. And tataha, and from that, when you have sukha and dukkha, then what, what will you have? Raga and dvesha. Compulsions to pursue what you want, per compulsions to run away, avoid what you don't want. And from that raga dvesha, Shankara ends this word with kriyaha, next verse please. But in the next verse he explains that those kriyas are dharma and adharma. Dharma and adharma kriyas, actions. Dharma and adharma deeds, we'll simply call it. Stay with English. So you commit deeds, both righteous deeds and unrighteous deeds. But whenever you commit a deed, you get some of the results of those deeds in this life. But chances are you don't receive all of the results of all of the deeds you commit in this life. So when you die, whatever karmas that are yet to fructify, what happens to those karmas? They're dumped in the bucket, so to speak. <laughs> the bucket of sanchitta karma, meaning after you die, your ka whatever karma is left over from this life, add to your sanchitta karmas. Your sanchitta karmas, which are already infinite in number, so it keeps you going. That infinite karma leads to getting another body, a body which is subject to pleasure and pain, which drives you to be compelled by raga dvesha, which leads you to commit righteous and unrighteous acts, accumulating yet more karma, and there you are stuck in the cycle. This is called samsara chakra. Chakra, most of you don't, means circle. The cycle of samsara. Samsara means that which keeps going on and on and on, like some of my classes, they go on <laughs> and on and on. So that's the idea of samsara. It just keeps going and going and going. And it wouldn't be so much of a problem if it weren't for dukkha. Every time you get born, dukkha is inescapable. If you could escape dukkha, then you know, who, would, who would not want to be reborn if you could do so without being subject to dukkha? But dukkha comes with every birth, and therefore the samsara chakra is a cycle of suffering. And we're going to discuss how to get out of this chakra is our next topic. Let's finish off this verse. Back here. So, Shankara concludes then that, yeah, a in the second half, evam thus, ayam, ayam means this. This is is uh, next line, I am samsaraha. This is samsara. And it is nitya pravrittaha. It is constantly going on, constantly in motion, constantly going around that chakra. And he says, chakravat, like a circle. 
you are caught in this, in computer language, endless loop. Some of you know that kind of expression. You're stuck in an endless loop, and that endless loop is brisham. It is continuous. Brisham can also have the sense of being something that's a little forceful. So you are inescapably caught in this cycle of, of birth and death. Now, before we go on, there's one important point. We'll see how to get out of the chakra. We'll see in just a moment. But let's be very clear what doesn't work to get you out of this chakra. Um, can you accumulate enough good karma to get out of this chakra? So do more rituals. So accumulating good karma leads to more, let me go back to the board, here. So if your strategy is, let me do more rituals, by doing more rituals, I gain, but I, I do dharma kriya, dharmika kriyas, righteous deeds, which gives me good karma. But, but look at this. Karma causes you to get reborn, whether it's good karma or bad karma. At best, good karma can take you to swarga, heaven, for one lifetime. But that lifetime in heaven eventually comes to an end. In your next life, you're back to suffering dukkha. You've heard me uh, compare going to heaven is like going to Hawaii. So you go to Hawaii, you have a nice place to stay and you enjoy the whole thing. But after, you know, seven or ten days, yeah, your, your money is spent and you have to come back. That's really a good metaphor for going to heaven. So if you merely accumulate good karma, the, at the best case scenario is you get a holiday from dukkha in heaven, but that holiday is short-lived, comes to an end, and you're back to this cycle Suffering, su uh, suffering, dukkha. Is there any kind, any kind of action? This is a little, t uh, let, me, let me try to make it very simple. A very American thing. Tell me what to do, right? Americans are doers. So tell me what to do. What do I have to do? to get out of this samsara chakra. Anything you do is karma. <laughs> so doing, even doing good things, only keeps you trapped. So the solution cannot be what you do. Moksha is not the result of a deed, of a kriya, of any kind. Also, bear in mind that we said before that all deeds are finite. We would understand moksha as being an infinite result because once you gain moksha, you are never again reborn. You gain liberation, freedom, enlightenment, for all eternity, if we understand moksha then as an infinite or eternal result, the cause cannot be finite deeds. Finite deeds can never have an infinite or eternal result. So, what then is the solution? How to get out of the samsara chakra? Shankara gives us the answer in the next verse. Agnanam tasya mulam syad, agnanam tasya mulam syad, iti tadhana mishyate, iti tadhana mishyate, brahma vidyata harabdha, 
ब्रह्म विद्या तथो निश्रेय संभवेत तथो निश्रेय संभवेत थस्या for that samsara chakra agnanam mulam syat ignorance is the mula the root cause ignorance is the root cause for the samsara chakra and we need to see exactly how how that is so Let's go, let's, let me go back to the board one more time. So, how can we say ajnana is the root cause? We don't even see ajnana up here on the board. In what sense is the root cause for this samsara chakra ajnana, ignorance? And obviously ignorance here means a specific kind of ignorance. Ignorance of your true nature, of Satchidananda Atma. Ignorance that my guru called self non-recognition. That, how does that ignorance perpetuate the cycle? And the way you can see it is in one particular place, and that is here. Suppose you didn't have ignorance. Suppose. If you didn't have ignorance, what would be a consequence of that? You would recognize your own innate fullness and completeness, your innate divinity, your utter fulfillment and contentment, which is absolutely unshakable. You would recognize that about yourself. You would realize that about yourself. So if you were enlightened, full, complete, and, of course, you have a body, and having a body, you don't have any choice. <laughs> Along with the body comes sukha and dukkha. But watch this. If you were enlightened, and your body had some pain, or there was something nice out there that you thought was attractive, some nice food or whatever, would you be compelled, watch my words carefully, if you were enlightened, would you experience the compulsion of raga and dvesha, or would you simply say, koi eh. <laughs> bat nahi? Doesn't make any difference. To experience some sukha dukkha when you recognize yourself to be full and complete and limitless, who cares about a little sukha and dukkha due to the body? No big deal. You would not, if you were enlightened, you would not be driven to raga and dvesha. This is where the samsara chakra gets broken, and this is why ignorance is the mulam, the root cause. As long as that ignorance is present, sukha and dukkha necessarily leads to raga dvesha, which necessarily leads to kriyas, both dharmic and adharmic, which keeps the whole cycle going perpetually. So here, the cycle is broken, and one, we need to introduce two terms here, one who gains knowledge becomes enlightened while they're, while they're alive. Such a person we understand as a jivan mukta. One who is mukta, liberated, jivan while alive. So when you become a jivan mukta, enlightened, liberated by, while you're alive, that sukha and dukkha will no longer drive you like to, you will no longer experience the compulsions of raga dvesha and stay trapped in this loop. Then, what about next life? We still have this infinite 
sanchita karma. And we have to find some way to become freed of that sanchita karma. Otherwise, you can be liberated in this life and then get reborn into all this, all this suffering once again. For that reason, we find taught in many, many scriptures, including the Bhagavad Gita, is that when you become enlightened, not only does that ignorance get destroyed, preventing you from being compelled by Raga Dvesha, but there's a second benefit. So one benefit is immediate in this life. You recognize your innate fullness, completeness, divinity, and you're no longer subject to the compulsions of Raga Dvesha. That's an immediate result. That is what happens for the Jivan Mukta. Then, when you die, what all those scriptures teach is that this sanchita karma gets burnt up so to speak, by this, they call it jnana agni, the fire of knowledge, the fire of wisdom. This enlightenment is held to be so powerful that it removes the sanchita karma. It's, it's said to burn up that sanchita karma. In other classes, I've described it in a little more nuanced way by saying, you no longer have ownership over that sanchita karma. You might remember that discussion. I don't want to get into to all of that again. But however you understand it, either the more conventional way, all your past karmas are burnt up in the fire of knowledge, or my more nuanced way of explaining it, your ownership of that sanchita karma gets destroyed. In either case, after you die, this, after you exhaust, after you become a Jivan Mukta, you're no longer driven by Raga Dvesha. You exhaust your remaining karmas in this life. Your Prarabdha karmas get exhausted. Then, in the absence of Sanchita karma, you are not reborn again. Remember, to be born is to be experientially separate from Brahman. Not truly separate, but if you have a body, your experience is one of separation. So whenever you have a body, you, you will experience such separation, you will experience, even an enlightened person experiences sukha and dukkha, correct? So that all comes along with having a body. So the only way to avoid this dukkha completely and utterly is not to be reborn. And the only way to not be reborn is to remove that, that sanchita karma. One who has re gotten rid of that sanchita karma is called a videha. Yeah, let me change the terms to the uh, nouns. Jivan mukti is the state of liberation while living, and videha mukti is the state of being liberated after your death, in the absence of your physical body. So the, there, we understand in the teachings of Advaita Vedanta two kinds of liberation. There is one kind of liberation you gain immediately. By the way, not all traditions ascribe to this. There are many traditions, like especially the Dvaita Vedanta traditions, which hold that you won't get enlightened until you die. <laughs> when you die, then you can gain some kind of mukti. Advaita Vedanta rejects that completely and says, while you're living, you can gain liberation, and that liberation is in the form of knowing your innate divinity, that fullness and completeness, which then makes you immune to raga, dvesha, and all the suffering associated with chasing after what you want and running away from what you don't want. And Vedanta then says, in addition to jivan mukti, there is videha mukti, 
which is to say that not only is your ignorance destroyed, but your sanchita karma is also destroyed so that you won't get reborn. Okay, a little bit involved, but necessary to understand properly. Okay. So, coming back to the verse. So, tasya, for this samsara chakra, the cycle of life and death, ajnanam mulam syat, ignorance is the root cause for that cycle. Iti, thus, tad, by the way, for, for Sanskrit students, you really need to break this properly. Tat hanam. Hanam means destruction. When you put the words tat and hanam together, you get this very different form. The word is hanam, destruction. Tat hanam, the destruction of that ignorance, ishyate, is desirable. So if, if ignorance, and not ignorance in general, self non-recognition, failure to recognize your innate divinity, since that ignorance is a root cause for being stuck in the cycle of samsara iti, therefore tathanam, the destruction, the removal of that ignorance, is shate, is a desirable. And middle of the next line, ataha, therefore brahmavidya arabdha. Therefore, Brahma Vidya, knowledge of Brahman, knowledge of reality, knowledge of truth, Arabdha is begun. And Shankara here is referring to not the Vedas, but his text. So Shankara here is further validating the reason for writing, composing the Supadesha Sasri, and also the reason for us to study it. Since we want to remove that ignorance which covers the atma and prevents you from recognizing your innate divinity and that ignorance being the root cause of all suffering, therefore you want Brahmavidya Arabdha. For this reason, Shankara is Arabdha is undertaking, is beginning to teach this Brahmavidya, knowledge of reality, Tataha, through which Nishreyasam bhaved, through which there can be nishreyasam, the highest goal. It's a synonym for moksha. Shreyas, that which is best, nishreyasam, that highest goal of life, moksha, bhaved, can be gained through this brahmavidya. Good. One last comment here. We spoke about th this transformation from being a bubukshu to a mumukshu. Remember that? Bubukshu is one who wants enjoyment. Bubukshu is one whose goal is dharma, artha, and kama. That bubukshu recognized the limitations of worldly accomplishments, and that bubukshu is converted into a mumukshu a seeker of liberation. There's one more, level of liber one more level of conversion. When the mumukshu recognizes tasya ajnana mulam, when the mumukshu recognizes, mumukshu wants to be free from suffering. How to become free from suffering? When the mumukshu realizes that freedom from suffering is gained through spiritual wisdom, brahmavidya, atmajnanam, self-knowledge. When the mumukshu discovers that truth, that fact, that the end of, su the end of suffering is, is due to the end of ignorance, therefore the mumukshu becomes a seeker of knowledge. The mumukshu becomes a jignasu. Jignasu means one who seeks knowledge. So look at the, the conversion. Mumukshu, a seeker of worldly goals, becomes a mumukshu, a seeker of liberation. When the mumukshu discovers that 
only by removing ignorance can you become free from suffering, then the mumukshu is converted a second time into a jignasu, a seeker of spiritual wisdom. These are radical transformations in your worldview. We all seek something. What do you seek molds your life. Is that not true? What you seek molds your life. It's your value structure, your value system. You seek what is valuable. If you think going to the movies and fancy restaurants is what's most valuable, that's what you'll seek. When you recognize the limitations of those worldly goals, then you become mumukshu, a seeker of liberation. And then when you further recognize that liberation is gained through this spiritual wisdom, then you become a seeker of the spiritual wisdom and being a jignasu molds your life, I think, in the most beautiful way possible. It puts you on a path, a path which day by day, step by step, leads you to grow in wisdom, to grow in understanding, to grow in compassion, to grow in all ways possible to become a, a, a better person and ultimately then to follow that path to its end, which is to gain that Brahma Vidya, that knowledge of reality, that knowledge which removes the self non-recognition and puts an end to worldly suffering. That's a good place to conclude our class tonight. Um, I'll just remind, we'll end with a prayer and I'll just remind you first that um, if you have any questions, please email me. And uh, also this coming Saturday, we have our uh, guided meditation at 10 o'clock, uh, Bhagavad Gita class at 11 o'clock. And then Sunday, we'll have satsang at 6 p.m. So please join us. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kaschid Dukha Bhagavit Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor Ma Amritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Tatsat <laughs>